There is a term that has come into popular speech that's a bit hard on some people. It's used to describe those who respond to a setback or a situation not to their liking by getting in your face and letting you have it. They demand to see the manager. They want the teacher's attention. They want the supervisor so that their displeasure can be made known and the situation resolved to their liking. And they are known as Karens. Which is pretty rough on those uh, gentle-hearted people whose parents named them Karen and now have to go through um, with that kind of uh, label hanging over them. It, the, the trouble is that the generation who have really taken up this very aggressive approach were a generation uh, that also found the name Karen very uh, popular. How do you do when you're faced with a situation that is difficult, about which you don't feel very comfortable? I think there are about there are four common reactions. Uh, the first one is rage. And that's the one we've talked about. You kick, you yell, you scream, you be a Karen. We've seen it in the response to COVID, haven't we? People who uh, have objected to wearing face masks, who uh, rant and rave at the uh, people in shops and so on, who are asking them to observe social distancing, and yet they let them have it. There's a second way, though. Some people don't rage. Instead, they opt for the close-in, the resist. Whether that's just denial, there is nothing happening, there is nothing wrong, or or from a more passive-aggressive approach, inactivity used as a weapon. It can come with various uh, excuses. Look, I I didn't know, sorry, you know, I, I forgot. I don't remember you asking me to do that. Teenagers are actually experts at this form of resistance, aren't they? They just pretend you never asked them. It never happened. Resist. Then there's the one that's a little bit more common uh, amongst primary kids. Uh, Reluctance. I will do what you want me to do, but I'm going to do it so slowly and so half-heartedly that you will never ask me to do it again. Actually, the other ones that are really good at this are dogs. When our dog has done something, well, I will say, come here, and the dog sort of inches forward, little crawl by crawl. It's coming, but it's going to do it slowly. Rage, resist, reluctant, run. Disconnect from the people, the places, the reminders, anything that brings up the whole situation, just run. I saw on the news that uh, with all of the stuff that's going on in Victoria, some 20,000 people are moving out of Victoria, trying to leave. Rather than having to, to stick, stay around in issues of disease, um, with, with COVID, with the restrictions that are in place, with the job losses that are occurring... I wonder which one is your preferred go-to. Today we're going to look at someone who was asked to do something and they really didn't want to do it. And it was the final option that they chose. They ran. But how do you run from the God who made heaven and earth? As we begin looking at the book of Jonah... We're going to be confronted by the God of Jonah. A God who asks hard things. A God who is powerful. A God who is sovereign. But a God who loves us enough that even when we run, He chooses to chase us down and show us grace. So as we open God's Word together, would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that it is living and active, that it reads us as we read it. Be with us now as we open your word. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. 
that we might understand your word, accept your word, and be transformed by your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of Jonah. Now, I just want to say something from the outset. When I say story, I don't mean fiction. Right? We're used to the idea of a true story. What I mean by story is that the account of this has been shaped for the reader. It's meant to be read and it's, it's intriguing. It's got plot, it's got development, it's got ways that it's been written that help us uh, get captured by the drama of it. So I'm going to talk in terms of story, even though the events that it's talking about are historical events. And it's a story that in today's chapter comes in five scenes. So let's have a look at these scenes. In the first scene, we find Jonah being given a commission. Let's pick it up in verse 1. I'm going to need my Bible because that's not big enough. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare... And went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Well, what's going on in this chapter? Let's just take it piece by piece. Who's our main our main character is a guy named Jonah. Jonah, we're told, is the son of Amittai. Now, why is that important? It's important because this isn't actually the first time we've encountered him in the Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 14, we read of Jonah, the son of Amittai, who was a prophet to the king of Israel. So Jonah is not new at the whole prophecy thing. He's been working at it. He's been a prophet to the king of Israel. He's legitimate. And we can follow what he has done. But now it is later in the piece. The king to whom he was a prophet has uh, died. Uh, He's no longer on the throne. And now something has happened. The city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, has now grown. There is a king on the throne who has made something of this city. His name was Tiglath-Pileser III. And if you're looking for a name for your new child, can I suggest you look elsewhere? Um, Tiglath-Pileser III was a king who grew his empire in the way most empires grew in those days. And that is by sacking everybody else. And as his power grew, so did the fear of Israel. If you're wondering where Nineveh is, it's near Mosul that we've heard a fair bit about in news of late. Those are actually the rebuilt walls of Nineveh. The photo is black and white because thank you, thanks to the Islamic State, they no longer exist. They got torn down. Nineveh, the great capital, the huge city of the world empire that was taking over everywhere. And Jonah is told, arise, go to Nineveh, go to this city. But when Jonah arose, it wasn't to go to the city, it was to flee. And instead of arising, he went down. Down to Joppa, and then down into the ship in order to flee from the presence of the Lord. His aim was to go to Tarshish, a port city in Spain, basically as far west as you can think of if you lived in the Mediterranean. That's right at the west end of the Mediterranean, instead of as far east as you can think of when you are living in Israel. So Jonah the Israelite, being told to go far to the east, went far to the west. You get the basic picture. 
He's running away. And his idea was to run from the presence of the Lord. Uh, It's important we understand what that is getting at. The place of the presence of the Lord was the temple. The presence of the Lord is is God in His holy place. Now, because this is the northern kingdom of Israel, probably it's the shrines that they set up to God. A bit of an act of disobedience, but nevertheless, it's the place that for Jonah is associated with the commission that he has as a prophet of God. And he's to, he says, I want to go as far from that place as I can. Jonah knew or should know as every Israelite should know, that the God he is dealing with can't be run away from by moving distance from the, the, a shrine. The, in the ancient world, people did think if you got far enough away from a God's shrine, then that God couldn't influence you. It's only when you're near them that they could actually influence you. But Jonah would have known, as every Israelite knew, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, in the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Jonah would know that running is not running from where God can be. It's a running from everything that reminds him of who he is, of what his task is. Running from the sanctuary to which he would go to, to worship this God. He wants to get away from that. He wants to deny who he is. He wants to deny the task he's got. Now, notice that in our story, the writer doesn't tell us why. He's going to. In chapter 4, we'll find out why Jonah runs. But the writer doesn't tell us in chapter 1. So, we're left with a sense of curiosity. Why is Jonah doing this? Scene 2. Pick it up in verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give, us a, give a thought to us that we may not perish. Jonah runs. He, he wants to get away from the reminder of God's presence, but God is not confined at all. The God who is the Lord in Israel, the God who is Lord in Jerusalem, is the God who is Lord in all the earth. There is no place that you can run to from Him. Jonah learned what often we need to learn. Often when uh, when we do something of which we are ashamed when we do something that we, for which we feel uncomfortable, for which we feel guilt, our temptation is to run, like Jonah, to hide, to, to distance ourselves from those things that remind us of God and who He is. And so often when people fall and falter, when they sin, when they, there are things in their life that they are unhappy with, the first reaction is to distance themselves from church, from any association with the very God who loves them and cares for them. To try and do just as Jonah did. To cut the ties and run. But you can't run from God. Because God pursues. And Jonah is woken by the captain. 
who basically says, what the heck are you doing? Here he is, fast asleep. How can you be asleep in such a crisis? The men are up, up on the deck of the ship throwing out the cargo. When you're a trading vessel, you know the storm is really bad when you start throwing the cargo overboard. That's your pay. That's your income. And you're throwing it overboard in order to rescue yourself from drowning. So it's crisis time. It is the biggest crisis you can get. And there is Jonah having a nap, fast asleep. I wonder if that reminds you of anything, because it sure does me. A scene out on a sea with a boat and a storm whipped up and someone fast asleep in the boat. You can find uh, in Mark chapter 4, the scenario seems to be being played out again. And the question that the disciples ask is basically the same question that the captain was asking. Don't you care? Are you so caught up in your issues and whatever it is that you're just oblivious to all the crisis that is going on on the deck of this ship? We are going to drown. Of course... In Mark chapter 4, it is not Jonah, a prophet of the living God, who is asleep below deck. It is not Jonah, the disobedient prophet, running from God's command. It is Jesus, the Son of God, the one who is God with us. He is the God who commands the sea. And so we find Jesus giving instruction to the waves and the wind and they cease. But for Jonah, the crisis is there. He's called up on deck. Scene three. What have you done? Verse seven. They said to one another, come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And notice the question that the sailors ask, because it's actually a, a pretty painful question for Jonah. Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? You see, in Jonah's answer, he begins with the latter part of the question, the latter three. Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? Well, the answer to those three is, I'm a Hebrew. Really, that's pretty well captures it all. But what about your occupation? Because what is his occupation? What does he do? He's a prophet of the living God, and he's running away. This is the heart of Jonah's problem, isn't it? This is who Jonah is, and he's running from it. Well, he's put on the spot, and he admits, who am I? I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. In the ancient world, the sea was a, a place of crisis, a place of chaos. In fact, for many, the, the sea was the place of the chaos. If there were gods, they were chaos gods. They weren't to be trusted. So in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a world where they thought there were lots of gods, the, 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 the sea gods were the ones who you defeated because they were chaos. To find a God who is in charge of the sea and to run from him? To find a God who can rule both land and sea, who is that sovereign, that in control, and run from him is terrifying. But to find a God who controls the sea and run from him in a boat is stupid. 
To find the God who rules the sea and try to run from him in a boat is idiocy of the first order. That's why they respond like they do. What? What the? What is it you've done? See, Jonah had told them that the reason he was running is he was running from the presence of the Lord. Well, they got that. You just have to run away from the temple and get enough distance, you're fine. But is he the God out here and you're running from him in a boat? We are dead because of you. You can actually change that and still get the sense if you add two more words. What is this that you have done to us? What have you done that means we are going to drown? The response. Scene 4, verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quieten down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, has done, have done as, you, as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased and was raging. The question they ask it is, it makes sense when you think about a world where people think there are lots of gods. God's all over the place. That's why they were saying, everyone called out to their gods, hopefully one of them's listening and hopefully one of them's able to help. That's why they're so terrified when they find out that Jonah is worshipping a God bigger than any they've heard of before. He's running away from a God more powerful than any they've heard of before. And now they say, well, tell us what we can do. What do we have to do to you? You know, you've got to bear this one. You're running away. What, what ritual action do we do? What does your God look for to try and make this right? Now, I don't know what the answer should be here. Personally, I think, look, turn around, take me back to shore because I'm on my way to Nineveh. I reckon, actually, that's the best answer to that question. Drop me off so I can get back to Nineveh. Jonah is not yet at a point where he's willing to accept his mission. And we'll see, that's actually the story of the remaining chapters of this book. But for now, Jonah, who had gone low, reaches his lowest point. Throw me overboard, kill me. Hurl me into the sea. A death sentence. He um, doesn't quite say, I'm going to jump into the sea. He wants them to do it. I think there's a bit of... He, he, he's a, a bit scared of the whole thing. Hurl me into the sea. And then the sea will quiet down for you. He is a prophet. He does know how God works. And he knows that it is his fault. And he knows that this action, that it is he, not the sailors, that God has issue with. Jonah finishes this chapter, in fact, on a dark note. This is not a chapter that works well for Jonah. His response to God's mission to him is to run. It's to lie asleep in the bottom of the ship, exhausted and... Well, we don't know. 
and then to offer himself up to be killed on behalf of the crew. They did as they were told. And in response, God does exactly as Jonah said he would. The storm is stilled. The crisis is over. The ship is saved. The men can get back to trying to retrieve some kind of income by getting back to port picking up a new cargo, getting on their way. But as they see God's incredible action, they are moved to do more than that. As they hear Jonah stand up and at least in a crisis, acknowledge before them the reality of who he serves who he fears, what his task is, to proclaim that indeed he is a Hebrew, that he serves the Lord of heaven, the one who rules the sea and the dry land. And in response to what they see, notice, having seen what happens when the one who fears the Lord is thrown into the ocean, it says that they now fear the Lord exceedingly. It's the same term used for Jonah's relationship with God. They offer sacrifice to the Lord. They make vows. We don't know what happens a year from now. We don't know whether this crisis is something that leads them to a temple and then they forget about it, or whether this is a true turnaround for this crew. We just don't know. The, we, the writer doesn't tell us. And then we get the fifth scene, the end, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's funny because when we think of the book of Jonah, this is the verse, isn't it? There's one verse in chapter 1. And this is the one that everyone remembers. A big fish swallowing Jonah. It even makes it into popular culture uh, when we think of the story of Pinocchio. Pinocchio's father ends up inside a a whale um, working away at a desk in a big empty cavern. It's actually not the picture that we get at the end of chapter 1. What's the picture? Jonah's been thrown into the ocean And a big fish comes up and swallows him. And he's in the gut of the fish for three days and three nights. We don't hear anything at the moment, at the end of chapter 1, about whether Jonah is alive. In fact, it's the opposite. You see, three days and three nights in the ancient world was the time that proved a person dead. In a world where, you know, there's no heart monitors, there's, you know, no fancy equipment to go beep, to tell whether somebody's weak pulse is, is just weak or gone altogether. This is a world where, how do you know a person is dead? Well, the answer is three days and three nights. It was the test. Three days and three nights, they're dead. It's a very powerful image. Now, we know if we read on that actually Jonah is not. Jonah is still alive. Jonah is actually able to function in the belly of the fish. But here at the end of the first chapter, it's left up in the air. We're left fearful. What do we do with chapter 1 of Jonah, with these five scenes? And what on earth... Do we do with a chapter like that as we sit here in our homes, in church, in 2020, in COVID? What difference does this make to us? 
Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He was told to go there and call out against it. He was told to go and call out against it because it needed to hear God's message, God's word, because of their actions. We're going to find out a lot more about that as the chapters come. But God has a message that he wants to give to Nineveh. And he's asked Jonah to do something actually quite big. Jonah's task is a big task. Nahum, another one of the Old Testament prophets, you can find the book of Nahum. You might need the index to find it because it's not very long. But Nahum was given the task of actually preaching against Nineveh in writing. So he wrote and his message was an oracle against Nineveh. He could sit at his home in Israel and write his letter and... But that, that's not what Jonah was asked to do. He was asked not just to write about Nineveh, but to go there. To go and walk its streets and deliver God's message. It's uncomfortable, it's awkward, it's difficult. And it's all the more uncomfortable and awkward and difficult when we hear that God's concern that goes beyond borders, a concern that goes to the people of this world, is a concern that he wants us to take up as well. Jesus' last words to his disciples was to go make disciples of all nations. When Peter is confronted with Cornelius, somebody who doesn't fit the picture of the people of God that he had in his mind as a Jew. God shows him that vision right there in Joppa, the place from which Jonah left to go on his fateful voyage. Peter is confronted with the reality that God's concern is bigger. God's love for this world, his message to this world is bigger. And we are caught up in that, but it's an awkward message. It's a message that can generate hostility. It's a message that can make us feel uncomfortable as we take it up with friends, with family members, with, with people who we don't know how they're going to react And we do know that some people are going to react badly. It's true. Just like Jonah didn't know how people were going to react in Nineveh. Like Jonah, we are called to an awkward, difficult task of proclaiming God's message. And like Jonah, many of us run from that. Avoid it. Resist it. Drag our heels, participating in it as reluctantly as possible. The other thing that's worth noting is this chapter very much focuses on some rather curious details. Jonah gets into a boat. We're told a huge amount of details about it. He pays the fare. He goes down into the boat. The, the, we hear about what the sailors did, how they did it. Sure, it's been summarized greatly. Only takes a few seconds to read. It wasn't a few seconds of voyage time. But the focus that there is on them shows a concern that God has for this crew. A, show, a concern that God has for this crew of pagan sailors. These were not Israelites. You know that because when they're at sea and the crisis hits, what do they say? Call out to your God. We're calling out to all of ours. You call out to yours and perhaps one of these gods is going to answer. These are not believers in the living God. These are people who have no time for him and yet God is concerned for them. God is concerned for them and in Jonah, being thrown overboard is their rescue. As we look around us at our world, it can, it can frustrate us. 
as we look at decisions that are made that seem so frustratingly, uh, I don't know, selfish sometimes, foolish at times, destructive. As we see people flaunting other people's health for the sake of their own freedom. We've seen that, and it's really frustrated the world. Have a look at the comments on, it, on, on any of the news reports, and you will see how raging our world is at, at the way some things are done, at the way decisions are made, at the consequences of those decisions. We can look at our world and feel very frustrated, and sometimes we can look at our world and we can think, if only this world understood the God who loves them. If only this world would actually turn to God, but they don't. And yet God loves them. God loves this pagan world. He doesn't dismiss it. He loves it. And God's concern for this world is seen in Things like this chapter, as he shows concern for the crew of a ship. It's seen in his commission to his disciples as he sends them out to that world with good news. It's seen as God takes people and calls them to serve him here, overseas, amid frustration, amid hardship. Because God loves the world. And God loves Jonah. Jonah, with all of his disobedience, This story is a story of a God who pursued. A God who pursued the disobedient. Not with a big stick, but to bring him back. And that's exactly what we will read. A God who is far more involved in Jonah than I ever would be if somebody was treating treating me like that. It would be so easy to just say, I will blow you, I'll find somebody else. God can raise up a prophet out of anywhere. But he pursues Jonah. He rescues him. Not just from the ship, from the sea, from the fish, but from himself. We find a God whose pursuit captures the word grace. A God who does what we do not deserve. A God who chases after us. Friends, as we go through the story of Jonah, we're not just reading a very well-crafted story about a historical event from somewhere in the 700s BC. We're reading a story about a God who is the same God today. A God whose concern today is as great as it ever was then. A God whose concern was so great that he gave his life for the many. In Jesus, we see God's concern for a broken world as large as it can be written. I don't know what you do when you hit issues that you don't want to face when they are too big or too hard or too full of shame. Maybe you rage. Maybe you resist. Maybe you're reluctant. Maybe you run. But I want to remind you what we see here in Jonah chapter 1. God chases. God chases because God is full of grace and his desire is to restore. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you chase after us. With all of our brokenness and our frailty, you pursue us. So that we turn to you and can be forgiven and restored and given a fresh start. And Lord, for those amongst us who have been running or resisting or raging or reluctant, for those of us who have responded to things that we feel uncomfortable and awkward about, we've responded wrongly. Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to respond to your relentless pursuit your outrageous grace. Our Lord and God, we pray that you would help us to see that you, the God who chases after us, is also concerned for the people of this world, for all their frailty, for all the rejection of you, like us, you pursue them. And you call us to be your agents announcing your goodness and your love. Lord, where we have avoided that call, we ask your forgiveness. Help us to want what you want. To be disciple makers in this world for we pray it in the name of Jesus the one who gave his life that we might live the one who though the wind and the waves obey him nevertheless was obedient to death even death on a cross so that we might know life we thank you for your outrageous grace. Amen.